Um, and our mission is pretty simple, it's to do whatever it takes to make sure that every single student thrives and to contribute to the resiliency of our town. Everyone is there to support each other. I think that's what's most important for our students. Um, they have somebody that they can connect with. If they need anything, there's someone there to support them. Or knowing that I'm allowed to have the mindset of innovation and dreaming big allows us to provide so much more for the students we have. Holding our, our school community together um, so we have a shared vision while giving people the room to innovate and, and do their own creative thing. I think that's a, it's a healthy dynamic tension, but it takes a lot of work and relationship building. I can't even really wrap my brain around everything and all of the potential that this brings to our school. So good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Mike and Dr. Barry and, and Ms. McCaffrey for joining us here today. I'm Jennifer Chase, the Executive Director of Education Action Forum of Maine. And we're here today to talk about the St. George School District, to find out about the successes you all have had and, um, and see what other schools and, and districts can learn from you. So I thought first um, we could just go around and just do a brief um, introduction. If you could say your name and then your role in the school, and then we'll come back and Mike, you can go into some more details. So Mike, would you, would you start with the introductions? Sure. My name is uh, Mike Felton. I'm the superintendent of St. George Municipal School Unit, and next year will be my eighth year at the district in this role. Fantastic. And uh, Ms. McCaffrey? I'm Jamie McCaffrey. I teach fourth grade at St. George School, and next year will be my eighth year as well. Wonderful. Dr. Berry? I'm Jessica Berry. I'm the assistant superintendent and special education director, and next year will be my third year. Oh, fantastic. Thanks again for making time in, in, in July for this kind of conversation. So Mike, maybe you could start and just orient us. Where are you located? What is your district like? Um, just give us some background. Sure. So um, St. George um, MSU Municipal School Unit is a single municipality district in Midcoast, Maine. Uh, we're located obviously in St. George, uh, combined a, it's a combination of a variety of different villages such as Tenants Harbor, Port Clyde and Martinsville. Uh, year, year round population of St. George is around 2,500. Um, uh, we as a community withdrew from a larger district um, and in 2015 became our own um, single unit school district. We have about 300 students. Um, we have about 200 at our pre-K through eighth grade school that we operate. And we have another approximately 100 students that have high school choice and attend a variety of local area or high schools. Um, of those 100 students, about 14 students attend uh, Midco School of Technology, and we partner with them um, in a variety of different ways. And we can talk more about that later. Um, St. George is a traditional fishing community. Um, so the so the fishing industry um, is still strong here um, and is a big part of our history and and who we are. Um, you know, I always say that you know we are a community school, and the heart and strength of our school is the community of St. George. Um, and our mission is pretty simple: it's to do whatever it takes to make sure that every single student thrives and to contribute to the resiliency of our town. Um, so that's sort of who we are in a nutshell. And, you know, being a small school district and with the talent of the, the staff that we have and the support of our community, um, because of necessity and opportunity, we think outside of the box a lot. Um, and that's a lot of work, um, but it's also is where some of our best and most innovative ideas have come from. Mm, wonderful. Thank you. So I'd like to ask the three of you, uh, taking this a little bit of a step further, to describe what's so special to you from your unique perspectives, and you each have these unique perspectives about your district, right? Like what I've heard about your district so far is you are a small district. And I know from talking with Mike that you're designing specialized programs for students to be able to keep them in their district, in your district, for as long as, as, long as you can, obviously they have high school choice. And so what does that look like in the classroom? And what does that look like on the school level? Just so you could each speak a little bit about that first. And um, Ms. McCaffrey, would you be willing to, to go first to talk from the classroom perspective? Sure. Um, 
what makes St. George special is the people, I think. Um, I came down here because of the history of our school. Um, my own children attend the school, which also makes it very special. Um, you can walk into the door of our school and you know everyone. Um, and everyone is there to support each other. I think that's what's most important for our students. Um, they have somebody that they can connect with. If they need anything, there's someone there to support them. Um, in the classroom, in every classroom, we do what's best for students. So if we can envision something that we need to happen, it happens. Um, we have the support to make it happen. Um, we work really well in our teacher teams to um, create programs that um, are going to keep our kids innovated, uh, innovative, keep them engaged, and all of their learning is authentic. Um, what, makes, what else makes us special? Um, the fact that um, <clears throat> We have we have so much so much at our fingertips. So we use our community as much as possible. Um, now that we're able to have them back in our classroom, um, it's kind of special as well. That's been on hold for a couple of years, um, but we um, have our Jackson Memorial Library, which is right down the hill. So we work with them very closely as well. Um, we have the Herring Gut Learning Center in our town. They come into our classroom weekly, um, and with Blueberry Coast. So we have a lot of local, um, local businesses at, that support us. So, um, I feel pretty fortunate about that. Mm, that's wonderful. Yeah. Could I ask a, a, a question, a follow-up question? When you sure. say you have the support you need, could you describe what that feels like and what that looks like? Yeah. So, um, the support, um, if we need to bring something into our classroom that, um, we might not have thought of when we were budgeting, for example. We can find a way to make it happen. Um, if we want, if we want to get our kids out into the community, um, this happens. Um, there's always somebody there to help us. Mike is really great about say, "Hey, go ask this person; they'll know what to do." Um, we have uh, our technology director, Paul Minersman, is fabulous in supporting us to get our hands on whatever we need, um, whether it be. Um, using the, he's taught me how to implement the 3D printers into my classroom, which is wonderful. And our kids um, by fourth grade are able to create things on, we use the Tinkercad program. Um, they become independent in that. And that's pretty powerful. Um, Paul also has been really great about bringing, um, we have spheros, these little round, basically robots that we can program to um, support our math learning. Um, so we have, there's just, there's so much out there. And if you can think it, we can make it happen. So it's mm. pretty great. That must feel very empowering. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think, um, Jen, just what Jamie just said made me think that when we were first a school district, first year as a school district back in 2015, we had a gentleman from the community um, come to us who um, had retired to St. George and had, had a variety of connections. Um, his name was Wick Skinner. Um, and he gave us the seed funding for the makerspace. And um, it was a, it was an impromptu meeting. He just called one to talk to me and basically said, I want I want to help support you to do something that you would have never done otherwise and has a 50 50 chance of success. And the amount of times that happens in public education is almost zero where someone gives you that kind of space to operate. Um, and with that, you know, we, we started the makerspace um, program, but it also, I think, infused us from day one in giving us permission to dream big. Um, and I, I think the other piece of it is it's based on a foundation of decades and decades of incredible practice in the school among the staff and the community that was very much kid focused and community focused. Mm -hmm. So we've got really deep roots into the community and into our past and, and those are continuing to grow. So it's, it's, we, we've said about a variety of projects, our future is rooted in our past. Um, so there's a, there's a continuum there. Um, but that, that ability, that permission, and now I think the drive we all have to dream big, regardless of being a small district, um, you know, it, that's allowed us, you know, we, you know, when people want to do stuff, we don't necessarily have the answer right away. We usually don't have the answer right away. Um, but we figure it out. And like Jamie said, you know, usually it takes, you may take two, three, four conversations, but we keep going until we make the right connection with the right person or group. 
And, you know, it's never quite exactly like we envisioned it, but it happens. Um, and, you know, J Jamie's really been a leader in that and helping, like, by having multiple 3D printers in her classroom, different projects she's done with students, community partnerships with a variety of organizations, um, making that real. But I, I think it's, I think we all initially felt that permission to dream big. And now I think it's sort of who we are, that we feel an obligation to dream big. That's wonderful. And it seems like the, the that um, capacity that, that was given to you by this individual supporter really came out of a, a, a trust that must have been built, as you said, over, over decades, so to speak, with the relationship with the school, between the school and the community. So there was a certain level of trust and transparency there already that was then, um, yeah, maybe that was that made it easier for that kind of support to be given for this latitude that you, that you have here. Just yeah, no, absolutely. It was. It's. I think it's always been very much a community school, and when we became a community school district, um, I think that level of connection um, flourished even more. Mm. Dr. Barry, could you share from your perspective? Yeah, I think that's an excellent uh, transition for me because I think what's really special about our school is the permission to dream big. I was trying to find a place to be in my career where I could do that. And here it's not one person independently with these dreams. It's we all do it together, which has allowed us to start these programs that I'm going to approach it from the special ed side of things on, um, you know, and it, it's not a secret that, um, students or children as a whole are suffering more than ever from their traumatic experiences from for many different reasons. And our small school is not protected or hidden from, you know, uh, our children experiencing those things. So when I came in, um, it was a big job, but I think knowing that I was supported and that I could dream big and have the resources I needed was huge. So it started with, you know, looking at student needs and then saying, okay, we need to build relationships with all of them. And that's, I think that's the foundation of the school are the relationships that we build. And when you do that, you, it's easier to figure out the individual and unique needs of each kid. And I think uh, a piece that started there was that I was able to, we had older students who really needed a more hands-on approach. And so like I Googled, I'm not from this area. Like I had never been to St. George before I came down for like an interview or to visit. I did, had no idea where I was going. So <laughs> I Googled, you know, resources in the area for hands-on learning or like boat building. And I found something called the apprentice shop. And that's where some of our, you know, initial work started. I I uh, got a hold of the apprentice shop, which is where now we send, you know, around 10 kids to go learn, you know, the history of boat building and their building boats. And they um, were able to participate in the to uh, toboggan uh, national championship this year. They built their own toboggan and that small piece, that small you know, Mike was always like, yes, we can make those partnerships happen. Teachers were like, yes, let's do that. And so we were able through that partnership and uh, hands-on offering for students, we've seen them improve attendance. Um, their uh, assessment scores have like grown tremendously. Um, and so I think having the mindset or knowing that I'm allowed to have the mindset of innovation and dreaming big allows us to provide so much more for the students we have. Um, all the way down to our youngest grades, um, we're providing, we're looking at the child as an individual, not just me. And that's why when we started, I said, we're not really a special education department. We're programs. We, in larger districts, I feel like, you know, it is a department. But here we're small and so integrated with each other that, you know, Mike might be helping a student who's having, you know, as your superintendent is down helping a child who's struggling, laying in the hallway or having a rough moment, I might or my special ed teachers might be crying with a regular ed teacher because of a rough moment we've happened. We are programs in that we aren't this individual thing it's a school-wide approach to meeting the individual needs of each student. And we all dream big together and meeting their needs. And that has allowed us to keep so many students in this school, 
in their community, accessing the things that Mike and Jamie both talked about, you know, our Herring God Apprentice Shop, um, our own STEAM program and makerspace, um, just, you know, the social dynamics of being able to stay in your school, having friends, learning about your own community, um, we're able to do that because we have appropriate supports. But I think it all started with the mindset that we're all allowed to dream. We know hard work comes with that, um, mm-hmm. but we do it because we're no, we know we're meeting the needs of our kids and our community also, like everyone said, has a huge part. I've never been in a school where your school board you know, runs recess duty or might come down and, you know, read to a kid or where people stop by just to, you know, Hey, what do you, what does your school need? What do your kids need? We have toys and clothes and various things donated, um, from the smallest donations to the largest. It's not all about our biggest donors. We have people come in that just want to support the kids in the community And so it's this really surreal, but amazing experience. And it's allowed me to feel like I'm actually meeting the needs of these kids who are struggling the most. Um, So it's pretty incredible. Wow. That was just wonderful. Very, very, I feel um, inspired right now to, to, I'm just so glad that we're doing this interview and learning more about the school so that people can, can hear this story and hopefully find some some bit of it in their own story that they can build up and and build off of as a foundation. One of the things that came to me when you were speaking is this imagination of you're developing the individuals, this, these strong individuals, these these students, seeing them as individual people in the context of your community. Right. So it's not individualism, and it's not just te- treating every child as if they're an average. It's kind of the best of both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think speak to that a bit in that because I've worked in other districts and places, I think we're all as special ed directors, as educators, as superintendents, as people overwhelmed by the need that our students are presenting to us. And I don't think it's just a small school uh, structure that can meet the needs. I think it's forgetting the, or putting aside or dwelling in this is the need and oh, we're so overwhelmed and moving forward to the, how do we meet it? And I think that community connection is a huge part of moving forward and doing that. I think it can be done anywhere. I think that's a good point. And I think it's a critical point because we, we have certainly seen, I mean, just over the, the years, eight years I've been here, the, the needs of student students have grown dramatically. And we don't have a, you know, we have 200 students about our, K-8 pre now next year pre-K to eight school, but the number of students re- requiring intensive services has grown exponentially. Um, and I think one thing that we've learned, I think this applies to all schools, no matter what size, is as a school alone, we can't meet those needs. Um, but as a school work, working with our community partners, the larger community, and, and as a as a whole school community we have a chance to meet those needs of all kids. Um, and I think that approach is, you know, is open to, to every school and district. And I think it's, we have the advantage of having that sort of built into our DNA over the years that we are a community school and the community is very invested in the school. But I say, if it weren't for those community connections, we would not, we would not be able to do what we're doing now. Mm. One of the things that I heard you mention, um, Dr. Barry, was the hands-on learning and the, the the students having the opportunity, some of the students, to get out of the school and into the community using their hands to do something really beneficial that contributes also to the community. Um, so just two questions around that. Are there other ways the school, the, the students are able to do that in the community? Um, are there other ways that they're out kind of contributing? And then also, I would love to hear more about the makerspace. And maybe that's also you, uh, Ms. McCaffrey. How does that integrate into the day? How do all the students benefit from that? Not only the students who may have special or special needs. So if you want, I can just start with that. And then, Jamie, you can sure. um, move on with it. So I think it started with... Um, like I said, with apprentice shop, and then we're like, oh, this is really great. What else is out there? But they'd always had, uh, the school seemed to have always had this uh, relationship with Herring Gut, which, you know, each of these organizations provides a need or um, 
is a different interest. So marine life, marine biology, science, boat building, woodworking. Um, we also work with Blueberry Cove um, and we teach a junior main guide program. Um, some of the pieces that will then integrate into um, a leadership certificate at Midco School of Technology. So there's another interest. And so I think that's how we started and it's expanded out to our regular ed um, student population in that our sixth, eight, grade six or eight next year, we'll get a choice on some of these places to go. So we're, we're opening the doors to all of our students. Um, so that's how we've started to grow those things. But I think, again, it's based on interest. We know not all students are going to want to do woodworking. Not all students will want to be in our maker space doing robotics, not all students. So it's continuing to build those relationships with our community we start the relationship, Mike or I, or somebody might start it. And then our teachers or Jamie or other people grow them and, and, you know, connect our students to them. Yeah. Um, when I first came down to St. George, um, the school had already been a part of the expeditionary learning program. Um, and following that model, and we continue to do that as well. And that's another way that we incorporate in our community and we give back to our community. Um, every grade level, K to eight, um, does something throughout the year where they're doing um, some type of expedition, where they are um, learning multi across the disciplines. They're, um, for example, Last year, our in fourth grade, our focus was about animals and animal adaptations. And so we were working with Herring Gut, but we were also focusing on Maine and our community and what our kids might see. So we get out and we learn about them. Um, we bring people, we bring experts into the classroom. Um, but then we also, we try to create something that will give back to the community. Um, I know in second grade, they create bird boxes that go out onto our nature trail. Um, our third graders have done fundraisers for our fire department, which is right across the street. Um, our eighth, our middle schoolers with Alice in England have been working on the Alewife project where they're researching that. They've been doing that for quite a while. Um, and now they've created this beautiful art display for our building. Um, and their art was um, on display actually for the community down at a local art gallery um, right at the end of the school year. So um, there's we're we are throughout our community so um you can see pieces of our school there might be some of our artwork might be on display down at a restaurant in port clyde so we're everywhere so um i feel that um we're just a bit we're just connected so we're definitely in the community they're giving to us and we're giving back to them as much as possible yeah. so yeah, and again, I think that that has really deep roots and goes back. And, you know, for, you know, since I've been here, we've worked really closely with the local library, Jackson Memorial Library, and they provide a lot of our library services to students. And it's right next to the school so our students can go down and access that facility. And Jamie mentioned the, the Alewife project that our middle level science teacher, Allison England, did. And that was with the Conservation Commission, which is a department of the town. Um, where the Conservation Commission came to Allison and, and the students said, we want to know why the alewives haven't, haven't come back. And then she researched that for the past seven years, um, that project, and it had different evolutions. Um, and, you know, Jess mentioned all the ways that, and Herring got, again, a long relationship with them. And, and Jess mentioned, like, some of the newer relationships that are starting to flourish, like with Blueberry Cove, the Apprentice Shop, um, and Midco School of Technology and other groups. So there's a history and it's it's part of what we're trying to do is is continue that have that evolve and flourish as we move forward, because honestly, we it's not like we have an option. We have to if we want to meet the needs of our kids. Hmm. I wonder if there's anything that you would like to say about any obstacles you have faced, because it, it seems really clear that that the success that you're feeling and seeing and your students are experiencing is coming out of this connection to your community. And then also the community that you have created there in your school, the relationships between teachers and administration, and all of that, it seems very tight knit. And at the same time, leaving people plenty of room to follow their, their dreams and bring their, their dreams to the table, at least for conversation. Um, so yeah, what, what are, are there any obstacles that you faced along the way or continue to face? Well, yeah, I can start. I, mean, I think a lot of my job is <laughs> focusing on the obstacles as well as how to get around. But, um, you know, I think part of it is there's a there's a 
dynamic tension where you've got you you want we hire really talented people we give them space to work and at the same time we need to hold together as a community and sort of be headed in in the same direction um so th- it takes a lot of time and work and energy to foster those relationships and have the deep conversations you need to and you know the most limited resource we have in public education is time <laughs> So, uh, and, you know, COVID exacerbated all of that because we were so, even within the school, we were separate, trying to keep classes separate. We couldn't do big staff meeting, meetings. And um, so I, I think ho- like holding our, our school community together um, so we have a shared vision while giving people the room to innovate and, and do their own creative thing. I think that's a, it's a healthy dynamic tension, but it takes a lot of work and relationship building. Um to make that happen. And, and I, you know, there's obviously, you know, every year we do the budget and there are fiscal challenges because the, the cost of education, you know, continues to rise the needs of students and, and what we need to invest to meet those needs continues to rise. And, and, you know, the role of schools is expansive. We feed kids. Most kids get their mental health services through public schools. Um, we deal with clothing. We support families, um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, you name it, um, we're involved with it or partnering with the community organizations that are involved with it. And that's before you get to teaching and learning. Um, so I, I think managing all of those pieces, um, and, I, and I think that's the piece that I find the most challenging, honestly, is you have to do the day-to-day mundane things and check all the boxes and get the forms done to make sure everything's where it needs to be and the systems are set up while still having the time and energy to innovate. And I th- I think trying to figure out how to do that um, and prioritizing time, you know, for innovation is and, and relationship building is really important. And honestly, like, you know, Jess and I have been and talking a lot about this is, you know, next year, I think our only focus is going to be on reconnection, like reconnecting with one another, reconnecting with our kids and our community, our community partners, because through COVID, you know, you were almost in survival mode for a long time. Like, you know, it's, it is like Jamie started saying, like, what makes it special is the people. And for, for a community work, you got to have relationships and you've got to invest time in those relationships, even when everything else is pulling on your time. Mm. No, I was just going to build on that a bit. I think I, I would be lying if I didn't say that it was really difficult, especially in special ed, but in my unique role as assistant superintendent and special ed director, I'm with all staff. Um, but I think the need and the not, I don't want to say burden because that doesn't sound accurate, but the pull and the wear and the emotional piece that we all hold onto as we hear student stories, as we watch them struggle, as we navigate uh, navigated COVID, as we take on new things. I think that a large hurdle in my role is to continue to make staff feel motivated and heard and cared for and to try to find ways to push back against, because I mean, nationally, you'll see teacher shortages and burnout, especially in the area of special education. Um, and And with that brings, I mean, I think 90% of our special ed teachers are brand new. Um, So jumping those hurdles while having a huge influx of need and maintaining this level, this capacity is always difficult. But I think Mike and I talk a lot about, you know, our staff are the ones driving it and doing the hard work. So making them continue to feel special because they are, I think that's, that's a big piece of it. I think a big hurdle for um, uh, us as a classroom teacher has always been time, just like Mike said. Um, There's so much that we want to do during a school day. And in order to keep learning fun, but also keep our kids moving forward, we have had to work really, really hard and work collaboratively to figure out how do we incorporate all of this hands-on makerspace fun but still be learning everything we need to do. So we are continuing to grow as teachers to figure out how we're going to do this best. Um, And I would say from the very first day I've started at the school, I have grown exponentially as a teacher and doing and having the space and doing that. Um, I haven't always had the freedom to, to do those, that type of teaching. Um, And it's, it's a pretty incredible outcome that we get. 
It sounds um, quite remarkable that what, what it sounds like you're saying is you're prioritizing relationships and, and the well-being of the teachers, the staff, the administration, the students, you're prioritizing that. And, and you're also prioritizing the joy in learning and the, the joy in just getting, getting your hands involved and getting yourself involved in whatever way the students are, are excited about learning. And yet, or and, and also your um, outcomes, your measurable standardized testing outcomes are, are increasing or improving. Is that, is that the case? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah. It, it, it's always a work in progress. Um, and, you know, I think part of why, I mean, to do, I mean, I mean, all educators are working incredibly hard. When you're thinking outside of the box and creating, it is energizing, energizing, but it requires a tremendous amount of energy as well. Because you're, you're creating new things. You've got to figure it out. You've got to problem solve. And when you have all like we we are based on a community of interconnected people so you also need to deal with the challenges and the messiness that come with just relationships and and all of us people all of the staff and, and administration and and community members who we all have our own personality and interest getting all those different groups and individuals to work together and you know that's a lot of work and time and conversations um but when you can do it that's where the magic happens and but and when we hire, we try to be really clear to people, this is what you're signing up for. Mm. And for other institutions that probably don't operate like this, but when you come here, you're going to be connected to a lot of people. There's going to be a fair amount of unknown where you're going to have to create. There's going to be some messiness to it. And you're going to have to invest a lot of yourself. And, you know, I think we've been pretty fortunate to, to find and attract people who that's that's what they know that that's what they want. And they know that's what they're signing up for. Mm, that's wonderful. Mike, I'm wondering if there's something else that you could say about advice or an ask, how could, how could you in your role be supported by the greater community? Maybe I, I hear that you feel supported by your St. George community, but is there something in your role that could be changed or relieved or, or in some way, yeah, changed that would make you feel that you had more time to take care of all the people you're taking care of. So I've, I've always asked the question, well, the students need someone to care and take care of them. The teachers do that. And the teachers need someone to take care of them. And the administrators try to do that. And then who takes care of the administrators, you know? And so just, just wondering, is there something that you could say, if, if only that would give us all the time we needed or. Yeah. yeah. I don't have an answer for that one, but also <laughs> my, what I, what I've found is, I, I mean, we, we have, we have a more of a team of administrators now. And I found that has been really helpful um, with, with Jess's position. And, and, you know, we've had a principal, we're going to, we have a new principal next year. We're really excited about so that, that team of people and, and our, our staff who take on leadership roles. And honestly, I think just for me, some days it's, you know, you go to like recess with K2 and you play, you know, four square <laughs> with them more and, and run around and like, it just reminds you why you do what you do and, and pulls you out of the, the minutia and, and the, the weeds and all the, the forms and all that other stuff. And I, I think, you know, that's one thing I've always loved about this job. I mean, it's challenging because you get, you can get spread thin, but you, you get to see the big picture of where we're heading as an institution, but you also get to know the individual kids and what's going on in their lives and, you know, what their, you know, favorite games are out at recess and, and, and that kind of stuff. And, and that interconnection. So you keep the, what it's all about connected to hopefully the big ideas that, that are coming out of the school. Again, it's, I think it's, it's part of what makes this place special and it also requires a lot of work. Mm. That's really wonderful. Um, uh, my last question for you is, if you want to tell us a little bit about your dreams looking to the future, and I know you have a, a short-term dream around, you're, you've been raising some funds for your makerspace. Um, if you could just talk a little bit about that and kind of maybe how the community is supporting you in that. And and then what's what's next on the horizon? And Mike, maybe we could start with you, but then everyone else could jump in too. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Um... So, which is my specialty, but I'll do my best. Um, 
Yeah, so we've partnered with Midco School of Technology to create a pre-K through 12th grade uh, career technical education program, uh, CTE program. And as part of that, we're building a CTE makerspace building next to St. George School for our students and also the entire community. Um, so it'll have a space, a shop space for woodworking, boat building, metal work, um, some of the traditional uh, trades that were were taught in in middle school and in the past, um, but we're going to incorporate um, all of our kids pre K through eight. There'll be a maker space with three <clears throat> D printers, laser cutters, CNC routers, sewing machines, robotics, and there'll be a classroom gallery area uh, for students to work and display their work. Um, it'll be a community space, so we want to have communities in there through adult education programs, workforce training. Um, and also partnering with local businesses to give them access to some of the technology and training and help them scale their work. Um, and, you know, ultimately it's about re-engaging students in their learning through hands-on, minds-on projects that also engage their families, the larger community. It's about making sure that our students, when they graduate, they have the technical, creative thinking, social, emotional skills to meet the existing labor force demands that we hear so much about, but also create the businesses and industries of the future. And ultimately, it's about um, local economic development. Um, you know, we see this type of education as the future of public education. Um, we think kids' brains are so hyper stimulated these days through phones, social media, you know, virtual reality. They've got, you know, my son's got the Oculus and, you know, all of these things that to get their attention sometimes almost feels like a miracle. And I, I think, but what we've seen is with this hands-on work where they're fully engaged in creating, it activates a different type, like part of the brain. And you can engage them in a whole nother level and see them shine. Um, so you know, that's, I think, I feel like public education needs to go in that direction for that reason. And because I think we're not producing people with the skills that our economy and our communities need. Um, so we also see it as, as key to rural economic development. And I think the most beautiful part is it's what our community wants. Um, for years, they've been telling us they want these programs back. And, you know, we've raised $1,450,000 through federal grants, state grants, and a lot of um, donations from individuals, uh, local organizations, um, and also on um, business sponsors. Um, and our goal is $1.5 million, which we anticipate reaching by the end of the summer. Um, we'll start construction um, in the fall is our goal and our plan. And our hope is to have that open for the fall of 2023 um, and for that to provide a model to other schools um, of all sizes and types and geographies um, of how to how to offer this type of learning to all kids. I mean, this is and I want to stress people ask me, it's like, is this tracking? Is it a separate program? No, <laughs> this is for every single kid from the day they enter when they're four. And we want them doing this work and, and engaged it when they graduate at 18. And engaging with your whole community, because this is not, sounds like it's going to be a center for your community. So students Absolutely. engaging with other adults outside of the school environment is sometimes uh, rather uncommon and, and really amazing. Just it seems to me that you're building a tight knit community from the beginning. You're integrating these students into their community through their learning, through collaborative learning from the beginning. Really Absolutely. Exciting. We want if like a local plumber can't find a piece at Lowe's and they need it, you know, a piece of PVC pipe that they can come down and work with the kids and have the design and and hopefully be able to work it out and and, and print that piece. Um, you know, say it's back ordered, you know, for like two weeks and, and they can't get it at one of the local stores. They can come down here and work with the kids and print it. And then, you know, that tradesperson is learning, you know, how to like how to use some of this newer technology for their business so they can scale it. And they're working with the kids and the kids are seeing, you know, here's this here's this trade that I may want to consider. So um, it absolutely is. It's, it's going to be a community space. Hmm. Dr. Barry or Ms. McCaffrey, would you like to add anything to that in particular? Sure. Um, what I'm excited for um, for our new building is how it's going to bring our kids together again. I'm excited for how kindergartners might be able to work with seventh graders on a project. Um, I think that's going to be spectacular. Um, before COVID, we were able to do similar things where we had cross grade level um, projects, but this is going to take it to a whole new level. I'm really excited for that. Um, I'm really also excited for the opportunities it's going to bring us for just dreaming big. Like I can't even really wrap my brain around everything and all of the potential that this brings to our school. Um, 
yes, we do 3D printing in fourth grade, but I can't wait to see what else we'll be able to do. Um, what it's, it's unimaginable, really. We have, we just have this huge opportunity and I can't wait to start planning with my colleagues and figuring out what's next. Um, uh, so I'll just add on to that or end that. Um, I think we've seen some of our older kids. That I think um, the shortest answer is we're giving kids hope um, and a sense of belonging and goals. We have older students that maybe wouldn't have these opportunities and with them, um, I think it gives them a longer trajectory of um, success. And um, I mean, what else could we want if, other than giving students hope? And with that, with, you know, being able to offer this opportunity, it allows us to focus more on early intervention because our older kids are starting to succeed. They're growing academically and social emotionally. So then we're really pushing down to start to meet the needs of students earlier who will eventually then, you know, also have this, um, opportunity. So I, I guess long-term, there are so many things I want for special ed and, and they're overwhelming to think about, but I, I think I, I just want to continue to give, make this um, our students' homes because we certainly have kids who need that and continue to offer hope and what Mike is building here and what everybody's coming together certainly does that. So I'm wondering, given all of what you've told me, do you approach assessment in a, in a unique way or in a different way than you think maybe some other schools approach assessment and, and how students are, are growing in their learning and in their, in their personal development? That's a good question. Well, of course, we still we have to do the standardized state testing, just like everybody else. Um, but I think those numbers are just a small little piece of a student's overall learning. Um, and I know that in my classroom, and actually when I think of all the other classrooms on my three to five team, we don't sit down and do paper to pencil tests very often. Um, that doesn't, that's not how most students show their growth. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't, I don't know how other schools do, how they assess. I, I couldn't, I don't know if I could answer that because I'm not sure, because I, th I do think we are very unique, um, but I'm not sure how other schools are doing it. I think we're approaching it though, Jamie. So through EL, we, we're developing a portfolio system uh, of yeah. showing, you know, their competencies, their mastery of various skills. And we're, you know, that's new. That's, that's something we're working on. It's developing. And as we develop that, it could integrate what they're showing for a level of mastery. Like you don't have to do fractions and division and multiplication just in the classroom. You're showing us as you just built this amazing right. thing. Um, I think also with, you know, having all these unique needs in our school, we're, we're just getting to the point where we're approaching how, how can we provide more opportunity to show level of mastery that isn't like we, we don't solely rely on the Teachers are already very skilled at observation and multiple pathways of like showing their mastery. But I think the CTE building, having special ed programs um, in this portfolio uh, will allow us to put our heads together and, and, and get there. I think we're getting there. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's just standardized tests are one data point. Um, you don't dismiss it. If, if they're not good data, you need to ask why that is but it's not the whole picture. It's, it's, it's one piece of a mosaic of a much larger picture. And just like, I think before we want to wrap up, I do want to make, you know, just talk some about the special ed programs, but I would say when we started here eight years ago, we essentially had a resource room program and that was it. Um, and we had multiple students who were attending programs in other districts. Um, and last year, I think was the first year we had no students in out of district placements. And we've built programs for students with autism, severe behavioral needs, um, intellectual disabilities, and just different learning differences. Um, and, you know, I think there were some questions about whether you could do that in a small school. Um, and I, I think it's been, you know, very successful. And, you know, one data point is we've got no kids in K in pre-K through eight next year. We'll have to go to another school for a program and they can get it all here in their home district with their friends, with their cousins and siblings. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, a good data point and, and, a, and a 
important accomplishment. Mm, absolutely. In fact, I want to ask a follow-up question on that. Can you can you describe what does that look like? So how did how did how does that run? What is it what does it look like? How do you do that in small district? <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question. Um, no, I think we started really small, but realized, you know, if you take a traditional approach to okay, schools have day treatment programs, life skills programs, resource rooms, but in a small school, you can't have the same um, walls within programs. You can't define them the same way. So really what we did was um, create something called the ARC program, and it's an umbrella and we put kids together based by um, kind of need, but academic, it's very, they move around together so that a student who might have um, severe, profound autism or a disability, they might still spend some time in another special ed program with their peers because it benefits them in some way. Um, so I think keeping how we define our programs a little loose and just focus on what, again, what each unique need is of each student and moving them within, it's allowed us to serve students with behavioral um, disabilities and needs, um, students with autism, intellectual disability, all of the above. And have them together and with regular ed students. And again, you know, when we surveyed students, they in special ed, they all said they feel like they belong. They have a place to feel like they're cared for. Um, so that was the most important thing. And we, you know, we're still building and growing. Um, but I, I think that's how we approached it in a small school. That's a wonderful note to end on. Yeah. Thank you all so much for spending this hour sharing your school. And I hope I hope that you uh, enjoyed it. But I know that the schools and districts, people who listen into this can't help but be inspired. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good talking with you. Good talking with you too.